Dr. Kennedy says you can heal your anxiety once and for all. Yeah, sure, you're going to have moments where anxiety rise up and, you know, you're going to have stressful situations. But in terms of the ongoing overwhelm, nervousness, on edge feeling, he's going to teach you how to heal that. His work is life changing. And it has made a huge difference in my life. And I cannot wait for you to meet him in a few minutes. Now, the interesting thing about anxiety is that I am considered one of the world's leading experts on anxiety. And I'm what you call a life-tested expert because my expertise has been earned the hard way, the painful way. And that is by living through and struggling with anxiety for almost 45 years. The truth is, when I really think about my past, I don't ever remember a time when I wasn't nervous or feeling on edge or anxious or somewhere other than the room that I was currently standing in. I think if you can come out of the womb as a baby having a panic attack, that was Mel Robbins. And that panic that I was, I think, hardwired with in my nervous system, it only grew as I got older. In fact, you know how you go to those little camps when you're little, like with the Y or, you know, maybe you go to Girl Scout camp. I was so homesick at every single camp my parents tried to send me to, I would be sent home. In fact, there is this really infamous story about me. Uh, in sixth grade. So in sixth grade at North Muskegon Elementary School, there's this huge crescendo at the end of the year. And the entire sixth grade takes over the Boy Scout and Girl Scout camp that's like 10 miles away. And everybody goes to camp for five days and four nights. And it is supposed to be the most amazing thing that happens during elementary school. Everybody talks about going to sixth grade camp. Here's the thing about Mel. I was so riddled with anxiety and panic while I was there that I called my parents every single day and begged for them to come and get me. I was so out of control that the counselors actually acquiesced and said I could go home. Now, I want you to stop and think about that. Do you know how anxious you have to be to get trained counselors to basically go, this kid is out of control? We can't handle this. We got to get her out of here. Get her parents to come pick her up. Like, I, I, I can't deal with this. And so I got what my anxiety wanted. I got to leave. And as I was packing up my cabin, my friends came in. They're like, where are you going, Mel? Tonight's the big scavenger hunt. It's the last night. Why are you leaving? I lied to them and said, oh, my grandmother's had a heart attack. So my parents are coming. We got to go. We got to go see her. Yep. That was sixth grade Mel, full of anxiety, and it only got worse as I got older. In fact, before every track meet or tennis match that I had to play as a varsity athlete, I had such a nervous stomach. That was the term that was used back in the early 80s. She has a nervous stomach. Well, you know how I dealt with my nervous stomach? I would stand behind like a bush next to the tennis courts. And I would have this blue bottle packed in my backpack. It was a blue bottle of Melanta. This is an antacid medicine that old people drink for, for reflux. I would chug that stuff. It got so bad that my parents would start buying that stuff by the case. It was disgusting and chalky, but I chugged it anyway. Honestly, I can't believe I'm admitting this to you right now. And here's the thing. It only got worse. I mean, little elementary school anxiety mal turned into high school anxiety mal. And then, of course, I was college train wreck anxiety mal. I don't even want to admit half the things I did in college when I was anxious, like jumping from one relationship to another or waking up every single morning with uh, anxiety full of regrets about the night before. You know, when I stop and think about, oh, my God, I feel like I need Melanta right now. My stomach is starting to be like, and I laugh about it. But honestly, at the time, it's sad. Like, I, I just didn't enjoy college. I don't even like to go to college reunions because I did not like the person that I was back then as my anxiety was just raging out of control. Well, when I got to law school, thankfully, the anxiety got so unbearable that I got medical help and I was finally diagnosed with anxiety. And this would have been in the early 90s. And so anxiety was not a word that people threw around casually back then. I mean, anxiety meant there was something terribly wrong with you. 
People didn't talk about it. If you went to therapy, you were a freak. And so thankfully for me, though, this diagnosis, it was a godsend because I finally had a word and a doctor validating what I had been struggling with for my entire life for 20 years. He prescribed Zoloft. It was a complete game changer for me. It's almost like that medication acted like a ladder. You see, the anxiety and all the mental spiraling that it caused, that spiraling put me in a very deep hole mentally, physically, and spiritually. And that Zoloft was like a little ladder that allowed me rung by rung to start to climb out of that hole and do the work that you need to do to start to take control of your life. So I took Zoloft for 20 years. In fact, the only time I didn't take Zoloft was when our first daughter, Sawyer, she's now 23 years old. So when she was born, I had been off Zoloft. Uh, I had to taper off of it because we didn't know if you could like breastfeed or whatever on that medication. They know now it's safe to breastfeed with it. But when she was born, I had such severe postpartum depression, the really scary kind where you couldn't be left alone because the doctors were afraid you were going to hurt yourself or you were going to hurt your baby. It was a terrifying eight-week experience in my life. And so I'm telling you, between the 45 years of dealing with my own anxiety and on top of it, Chris and I having kids that have had anxiety that at times were so severe that they slept on the floor of our bedroom, I just always thought, okay, I have anxiety. That's the way that it is. It's just the way that I'm wired. I hate it. I hate having anxiety, but I just have to learn to live with it. I was wrong. You do not have to hate anxiety. And you do not have to just learn to live with it. You can learn how to understand it. And you can learn simple things that will help you take control of it and change how you respond to moments of uncertainty and moments of stress. And so in my early 40s, the anxiety got so crippling again because there were a lot of things going on in our life that were triggering it that every single morning the alarm would go off and I would lay in bed for an hour and I would just stare at the ceiling. And the anxiety, it's almost like it felt like a gravity blanket pinning me to that bed. And as I would lay in that bed and think about all my problems, time would tick by. The kids would miss the bus. I became a person I didn't even recognize. But I want to just tell you that I know what it's like when anxiety is ruining or running your life. Because when anxiety was at its worst for me, I created this thing called the five-second rule. And it was out of sheer desperation and fear that I created this thing. What is it? It's a brain hack. And if you ever feel overwhelmed by anxious thoughts or anxious feelings, just count backwards, five, four, three, two, one, and you can interrupt those thoughts and feelings and then physically move. And ever since I invented this thing, I've been teaching the five second rule on stages around the world, and it has changed the lives of millions of people. I know what you're probably thinking as you digest this whole story. How the hell does something so simple work, Mel? I mean, come on, for real? Five, four, three, two, one? Well, let me get you into action, okay? Because when you try this thing, you're going to experience the change yourself. One of the reasons why this is so powerful is because your brain has one job, and that is to keep you alive, which means your brain will resist any kind of new change you want to make. And The thing I'm going to have you do is going to make you feel this resistance. And it's important for you to realize that this is part of your wiring. You're never going to not have to push yourself to do things when you don't feel like it. Like this is just a fact of life. In fact, one of the hardest things for us all to do is to start something new. And there's a scientific reason why. The reason why is because pushing yourself to do something, whether it's pushing yourself to get to the gym or pushing yourself to change a habit or pushing yourself to stay sober or pushing yourself to speak up more or pushing yourself to express your boundaries, right? Or make the cold calls that are going to make you more money. All of that requires you to go from doing one thing like scrolling on your phone or sitting on the couch to doing something different. 
you have to summon something called activation energy. You have to activate the movement inside of you. One of the coolest things about why the five second rule works is the counting itself is an action. So it's almost like the little Trojan horse. So you're sitting there on the couch, you know, you need to go for a run, but it's raining and it's cold and you don't feel like it. You blew it off this morning. You've already made yourself wrong. It's now three o'clock in the afternoon. You can think of a million things that you would rather do than going for a run. You now know the secret. The secret is motivation is garbage. No one's coming to push your ass off that couch. This is up to you. The second you're sitting there marinating in your excuses and your sad sack, whatever, feeling low energy. I get it. I'm there every day at three o'clock right there with you, not feeling like it. The second you start counting backwards, five, four, three, two, one, you've made the decision to get off that couch and go exercise, even though you don't feel like it. The second you hit one, get up off the couch. Start walking toward your closet. Change into your running shoes, change into your tights, whatever. And five, four, three, two, one, walk out the door. That is how you summon the activation energy to start. And starting's the hardest part, right? So that's why this works. In addition to the physiology, in addition to the brain science, in addition to everything else, from a real common sense point of view, you are starting with the counting. And so I want to leave you in motion. I don't want you to just learn about this thing because it doesn't work if you think about it. You got to use the tool. And once you use it, you're going to be able to teach it to anybody in your life that's struggling because they're waiting to feel motivated. You can give it to anybody once you try it. And so what's the best way to get you moving? I want you to do a five-day wake up challenge with me. Okay. I know you're already groaning. I can literally hear it through my earphones over there. I don't want to wake up. Good. Okay. And for those of you that can just spring out of bed, first of all, you're a weirdo. And the way that we're going to make this uh, work for you is set your alarm. If you're the kind of person that just, oh, I just naturally wake up. Oh, I just spring out of bed. You're going to uh, set your alarm 30 minutes earlier because I want to manufacture the resistance that you are going to push through with the five second rule. For the rest of us who just hate getting out of bed, here's what you're gonna do. Tonight, set your alarm, okay? Tomorrow morning, when the alarm goes off, you're immediately going to feel yourself thinking about getting out of bed. You're immediately going to want to stay in bed. We all do. I mean, who wants to get out of bed? It's cozy, it's warm, it's yummy in there, you know? Especially if you're sleeping with your loved one or your fur babies, okay? I get it. That is me every single morning. When that alarm goes off, you're going to notice this moment of hesitation because you're not going to want to use the five-second rule. Good. That's that resistance. That's the fact that uh, activation energy is now required. That's your brain going, but I don't want to change. And then you're going to count five, four, three, two, one, throw those sheets off, stand up. You're going to hate this. Start walking towards the bathroom. By the time you get to the bathroom, you're good. So that's what you're going to do for five mornings in a row. Alarm goes off, count backwards, five, four, three, two, one. The second you hit one, the sheets are off and you stand up and start walking toward the bathroom. You're going to hate it. You're not going to feel like doing it. If you can push through the resistance that you feel every morning about getting up when the alarm rings, you can push through the resistance everywhere in your life. You are building a muscle, a muscle of courage, of confidence, of action. You are building the skill of being able to take action when you don't feel like it. And that skill will pay you dividends for the rest of your life. Now, I'd like to support you in this wake up challenge and let me support you. And here's how you can let me support you. 
Go to melrobbins.com slash wake up. W-A-K-E-U-P. One word, wake up. I don't think it's one word in real life, or maybe it is, but on the website, it's melrobbins.com slash wake up. If you, uh, the instructions for the wake up challenge will be there in case you want to share them with somebody else. And more importantly, if you share your email with me, don't worry, I'm not going to put you in some like, you know, I'm not going to sell your name to anybody. I just want to support you. I will send you a really fun, encouraging email every single day that you're in this challenge for five days, because I really want you to try this. And I want you to try this because you know, the five second rule, I'm so passionate about it, not because of my experience. I'm passionate about it because of the experience of millions of people around the world who have used the five second rule first to get out of bed and then to go on to make amazing, courageous, incredible changes in their life. And the same is going to be true for you, but it's only true if you're willing to push yourself. And here's the interesting thing about this challenge. Notice you don't feel like doing the wake up challenge. What, are you waiting to feel motivated to do it? I mean, isn't that the whole point of what we've been talking about? In order to get what you want, you got to push yourself to act before you're ready, before you feel like it. I mean, what's the worst thing that could happen? That you try it for five days and then you go back to hitting the snooze button? I think something incredible will happen when you place a bet on yourself, when you allow me to support you by sending you these emails. I believe that if you were to practice pushing through the resistance five mornings in a row, and it sounds simple, it is not easy. I think you would be surprised by how good you feel about yourself and the ripple effect that it creates in your life. That's what I believe is going to happen. And I can't wait to support you in it. You are one decision away from a different life, a better life. And yes, it's not going to change overnight. It changes through those decisions that you're making that add up over time. I hope you find the courage to make the decision that's going to change your life today. I'm asking you to 54321, sign up for that wake up challenge, melrobbins.com slash wake up and let me support you. When you start making courageous decisions, when you start pushing yourself forward, when you start going for bigger things, when you stop thinking and you start doing, are you going to fail? Probably. Will you mess up? I sure do. That's okay. I want you to just keep waking up every single morning, five, four, three, two, one, and show up for yourself again. Because it's what you do after you fail. It's what you do in those moments when you don't feel like it. It's those moments when you push yourself that matters most. Do not waste another day of your life waiting, wishing, or hoping motivation comes. All the things you desire are right in front of you. They're waiting for you, waiting for you to push through all of that resistance and self-doubt and walk toward what you want. No matter how old you are or what's happened in your life, you can achieve the life you want. I'm sorry, you don't have to believe it. I've got enough confidence in this fact to believe for you until you catch up. I have way too much evidence having seen the lives of millions of people change through these small decisions to know that yes, you can change your life too. You have dreams to fulfill. You've got a world to change. You've got a life to live. So I want you to get your butt out there and five, four, three, two, one, go do it. I will see you in the wake up challenge. I will see you in the next episode. And I am so excited to be kicking off this whole new chapter of my life with you. Thank you for being here. And more importantly, thank you for trying this because thinking about this tool is not going to change your life. Motivation is garbage. No one's coming, but you got everything inside you that you need. So five, four, three, two, one, go do it. Where do we all begin? Yeah. It, you know, the thing is first understand that food creates mood. Food creates mood. 
So we're always trying to find out ways to make ourselves happier, right? think more clearly, be more satisfied, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's why I got so interested in this work because with my background in nutrition and being a doctor, I thought, well, if we can control our mood through food and the actions that we take on a daily basis, why aren't we talking about this? Why isn't this first-line therapy? Um, there's really good research, uh, a new study from South Australia, that the combination of diet and exercise yep. was 1.5 times more effective for depression than the leading medications. Now explain why, because that's a big research result, that just through food and exercise, yeah. it was found to be one and a half times more effective than medication alone. And if you think about it, they actually even put therapy and medications, kind of the traditional treatment, into yeah. one category. Okay. And they compared that with changing your diet, with changing your sleep, your exercise lifestyle habits. Okay. And they said, we should be prescribing this as first-line therapy for depression. There's an anxiety, the multiple anxiety studies, ADHD. I mean, we are missing the boat. Obviously, we're not doing something right because depression is skyrocketing. So is anxiety. So is obesity. So is diabetes. So is cardiovascular disease. So the status quo is not working. So why not employ these techniques and put them at the forefront? So things like we talked about in already and that are in the book are teaching you that we have control, that yes, do all the things, but also change the way you eat, change the way you exercise, get more sunlight. Well, you might be depressed and anxious and struggling with a lot of stuff because of what you're eating yes, and because of your lifestyle right now. And so I think it's really great news to hear that you can feel better if you start to eat better and that this whole cycle that you are trapped in, in terms of the cravings that never end and the cycle of emotional eating and feeling lethargic and feeling anxious, that you can, based on the research and based on the work that you do with patients around the world, that when you take your food intake seriously, you can profoundly change your mood, you can change your body, you can change your lifestyle, all of it, but it begins with the food. Okay, so you're in a situation and you're overthinking and your mind is spiraling and you're in that worst case scenario loop, tools to get that moment under control. Go, go into your body. Get out of your head. You're not going to find the solution in your head. It's not there. You know, uh, stop looking for peanut butter at the hardware store. You're, you're not going to find it there. You're not going to find the solution in your head. But now, whatever you focus on, you get more of. So if you start focusing on your thoughts, of course, you're just going to get more thoughts. And that's just going to be a, an endless self-fulfilling cycle. So consciously, you have to realize, what happens to me when I feel anxious? Where do I feel this anxiety? And can I train myself? to go, oh, there's that pain in my chest again. There's that pressure in my solar plexus. There's that lump in my throat. That's a sign that I'm starting to go into alarm. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into my body. And this is one of the other times where I, I, you know, I get people to draw on the best times of their life. You know, change that feeling state. Can I go ask back. you a question real quick? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so I want to go right to the moment. Okay. that the thoughts are spiraling mm -hmm. and you realize you're trapped in this worst case loop. Should somebody do the psychological side? To Physiological side, exactly. Yes. Just do that to stop? To start. Yeah, okay. you got you to break the cycle, right? Or so that's a great way of breaking the cycle. Use the five second rule, five, four, three, two, one. Absolutely. To just stop that's the another cycle. One. Yeah. Is there another one? to stop that spinning of thoughts? Breathing is probably the most effective. Okay. You know? um, just being aware, first of all, because a lot of times what will happen is because our frontal cortex gets uh, impeded by survival physiology, we don't realize 
that we're in anxiety. We can sit in anxiety for hours and not realize that we're in it. So if you don't realize you're in it, you just feel it. You just feel this terrible feeling. You can't change it. So you develop this awareness. Okay, this is my alarm coming up. Mm. That's your first thing. So at that point, five, four, three, two, one, get out of the house, put my shoes on, go to the house, go to the gym, go somewhere, do something. Like do something to break that cycle. Because if you don't break that cycle, you're going to sit there and ruminate and ruminate and ruminate. And rumination has tremendous inertia to it. Like once you start getting into negative thoughts, you don't feel like doing anything. It's like when Warren passed away and you didn't want to go anywhere. You don't want to do anything. Physiologically, we go into the vagus nerve shutdown and that shuts us down. And we don't want it. So we need something outside of ourselves. 54321 is awesome, by the way, because it just, it really, it's like, okay, after you've done it a bunch of times, you can, okay, you have to change your state. And one of the best ways of changing your state is changing your body. And one of the best ways of changing your body is starting to freaking move. Yes. So, you know, I I can sit there and I remember being in med school with the the covers up to my chin. Like I can't get into school today. And I always did, but it was like, you just wake up and you're in this panic. Like I can't get in there today. And I didn't have five, four, three, two, one back then, but it was just like, okay, I have to move. Like I have to move and giving myself a reward to move like, okay, I'm going to get a nice cool glass of water. Now wasn't that appealing, but it was just something, it was something to break that cycle. Cause if you don't break that cycle of rumination, it will just run roughshod over you. What is it like to live without anxiety? Cause I think part of, and the reason why I ask this question is I think so many of us have lived in a alarm state for so long. We don't know what it's like. Mm-hmm to be able to turn it off. So what is available to everybody if they start to do the work in their bodies? uh, A direct access to a repeatable process where you can find peace. Maybe not right away. Maybe it takes you five minutes. Maybe it takes you 10 minutes, but at least you're on the right track. At least you're not, you know, I used to feel like I was, you know, a a bubble in an ocean because whatever the ocean went, wherever my emotion Mm. went, I was taken with it. And the thing about starting to find that peace in your body is you kind of go down below the surface of the waves and you kind of look up. This is the image that I get anyway. I look up and I can kind of see, you know, kind of that hazy blue when you're under the water Mm -hmm. and you're looking up. Mm -hmm. I can see the waves there. And it's, you can create this sense of separateness, ironically, from the alarm where this isn't all of me because when you were a child it was all of you like when you were in your trauma as a child there was no way out there wasn't you'd look everywhere and there was no way out but as an adult you can look and you can start seeing you know what i i feel you alarm like i feel you there and i know that you were my younger self but i can see that there's there is a sense of separateness there that i i don't have to completely be taken over by this Now, at the same time, the paradox is that alarm is your younger self. So you want to be attached to it. So can you see the alarm with this sense of curiosity? Because when you look at something with curiosity, you take a lot of the emotion out of it. It's like, hmm, that's really interesting that I've got this sense of alarm in my solar plexus, that it feels heavy and sharp and purple. Wow, that's really, that's really interesting. Because when you look at it with curiosity, you're changing your sort of psychological mindset towards it. And when you start changing it in any way, it starts making that cycle easier to break. So when you get caught in in rumination and thought, you can start going into your body, even if it hurts initially, because you are on the right track and your, your ventral tegmental area, the part of your brain that secretes dopamine will start telling you you're on the right track. And, and I think that's when we start healing, we start being, get this sense of power over the alarm because we have been prisoners of it for so long. And in a way, we are prisoners of our younger child. If we don't pay attention to them, they will make us miserable together. So when you start paying attention to that and you start knowing, hey, I'm on the right track, like dopamine starts going in your brain. When you're on the right track with something, you get all these sort of feel-good chemicals. And then you have a sense that you are no longer this passive you know bubble in the ocean anymore like you you have something that you can tap into that's in all of us i mean this power and and we see this a lot with people that have had spontaneous remissions from cancers and from horrible diseases and stuff they feel this power in them 
that they didn't know was there, but they just feel it. They just feel that power. And I think what happens when we have trauma as children is we lose faith in that power. We lose sight of that power. So when you connect with your younger self again, you can have access to that power that's in all of us, that just that sense of peace. You know, I think in the Bible, like they call it the, 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 the peace that passeth all understanding. And you get into that state. And when you start healing from anxiety and you start realizing, hey, it is actually safe to feel safe. There, there's a tremendous feeling of, of rush of, man, I suffered from this for so long. Why did I wait so long to do this? Well, I know for me personally, it happened a lot faster than I expected it to. And the experience for me is emotional peace. Like mm -hmm. there's a level of steadiness. There's a calmness, uh, confidence, like it's all available to you. And I think when people really resonate, particularly with either the way that I move through life in the last year or two, or how our son Oakley has this just steadiness, this presence, that, uh, that's emotional peace that you're experiencing. And everything that you talked about related to the fact that so much of this is about the separateness or the unsafe feeling that we all experienced at some point during childhood and how the alarm sounds now that we are adults. But there's this emotional immaturity in most adults, meaning they are just children trapped in adult bodies who are incapable of handling the feelings and the sensations that are rising up in their bodies, which is why they act in ways that feel very toxic or abusive or confusing. And it's why we do that and then regret it. And the whole solution to all of this is this three-layered approach we've been talking about today. Is first, you got to become aware, aware yeah. that you have this alarm, that it's getting triggered, in your adult life and that there's shit that went down when you were a kid that needs your attention and needs your healing and it has everything to do with you learning how to make yourself feel connected and safe and taken care of. And then there is the coping with it, which are the bazillion strategies on TikTok, which by the way, um, a lot of it is horseshit. And so you got to be very careful. Yeah, it may go viral, but in the coping realm, therapy is amazing if you can afford it. And all the modalities are incredible in and help you to cope and breathing and meditation and yoga and walks in the woods and lots of things that, that you know, both Dr. Kennedy and I recommend. And it will help you cope and it will help the anxiety dissipate. But if you really want to dismantle the alarm, you got to go a layer deeper, which is in your body finding the source of the alarm, repairing yourself and that little person inside of you that felt alarmed, and then taking care of yourself by staying in your body and becoming aware of when the alarm goes off before it hits your mind and feeling your way through these things. It's remarkably powerful what you're talking about, Dr. Kennedy. And I think that that's, that's really, you kind of hit the nail on the head. I mean, there's, there's superficial things we can do, you know, physiological sigh, breath work, grounding, just feeling your butt in the chair, feeling your feet on the ground. Like there is something psychological about being grounded. It does help us for sure. Touch, you know, touching yourself, touching other people, um, you know, temperature, feeling, you know, going through those extremes of temperature, cold, heat, whatever. Temperature is one of those ways that we can access the deeper structures in our brain too. Smell, you know, if you have a, an essential oil that you love, like lavender or chamomile, rather, carry it with you. If you're struggling, smell is one of those things that it's the only sense that doesn't get processed by the thalamus. The thalamus is kind of like this central switchboard of the brain. Mm. Smell goes right into our emotional brain. So if you have something mm. that smells good, 
it will change your, your state right away. There is this thing also about moving your eyes back and forth, side to side, sort of the basis of EMDR. And it does show that if you move your eyes back and forth, back and forth, not up and down, but back and forth, it does decrease the activity in the amygdala. Now, mm -hmm. all those things are coping strategies. To heal, you've got to find the alarm. You've got to find the trauma. You've got to find your younger self. You have to have faith in yourself. Mm -hmm. Because I, th I think as trauma, when, when we get traumatized as children, we lose faith in the world. And when we lose faith in the world, we start believing everything is up to me. And if you're mm -hmm. a seven-year-old and you think everything's up to you, life's going to be very anxious. You're not going to. And finding that power inside of you, that power that that the people that had the spontaneous remissions from cancers and, and multiple sclerosis and all those sort of things, there's this power inside all of us that we lose with trauma. It's finding that again, it's really important. Having gratitude for the pain, having gratitude for the alarm, because that's your conduit to your healing is that mm. alarm. So as much as you bemoan having it, it's actually a beacon to your younger self. Be grateful for that sense of alarm because you have a, you have a pathway now to find that child and play. It's, it's so important to adopt play because when you play, you start changing that autonomic nervous system and that autonomic nervous system runs your life. So the more you can play, the more you can regulate that autonomic nervous system, that sympathetic parasympathetic nervous system, the easier life is going to be, the more connected you're going to be to yourself and maybe more importantly to others because we need others because loneliness is killing us. Separation so, is killing us. Um, give me your top three recommendations for play that you give to your patients. Well, I, I often ask people like, what did you do when you were a teenager? You know, some people say, I rode my bike, I played chess, I did this. So things that you liked when you were a kid, chances are you'll still like now. So that's kind of, there's no sort of global thing that I suggest to people. You know, ideally it would be something that's fun that doesn't really have a winner and a loser mm. kind of thing. That, you know, and Gordon Neufeld, who's my sort of mentor in developmental psychology talks about that with kids. It's so important to have play just for play's sake. There is no winner, there is no loser. There's no, there's nothing there. And one of the things that I really recommend for parents is playing around the dinner table with facial expressions. Like, how am I feeling when I make this face? How am I feeling? Because then you're actually maturing their social engagement mm. system. You're maturing the part of their brain, you know, facial expression, body language, eye contact. You're, you're improving the part of their brain that allows them to soothe others and soothe themselves. So it's important to do this in a playful way, you know? And, and that's really... Once we start really adopting play in our day-to-day -day life, then we start regulating our nervous system and in a way that you don't have to academically go back and find the trauma. Amazing. Dr. Kennedy, anything else before I wrap up? I think it's really being you know, compassionate for yourself. I have this process in the book called ABC. So A is awareness, as you say, be aware what anxiety or alarm feels like in your body. B is for body and breath. So go into your body, go into your breath. Physiological sigh is great. Getting grounded in your body. And then C is compassionate connection for yourself and specifically mm. that younger version of yourself. So if you do that each time that you have anxiety or alarm, you will start training your nervous system to focus on something that will heal you instead of focusing on your thoughts, which are only going to make you worse. Amazing. So as Forrest Gump would say, that's all I got to say about that. <laughs> For anybody that is just experiencing anxiety or you just feel really stuck, how do you begin this process? So most of the time people come to me and they don't know they're avoiding. They have no clue they're avoiding. So the first step is really pausing. Give yourself five minutes. Sit down and think about the things that you want to do. So let's think about the dream life. What are the things you want to do? And then ask yourself why you're not doing it. What are the things that are getting in the way? And you're going to pretty quickly identify your avoidance. I'm not doing this because I'm afraid of heights. I'm not doing this because if I ask for a raise, they're going to find out that I'm not good enough. I'm not going on this date because I don't think I'm pretty enough. Right? And so if you pause... Think of your dream life and then ask yourself, what are the obstacles here? You're going to identify the avoidance. That's the first step to changing. Wow. And what if somebody goes, I don't really know? So one way to do this is look at the mirrors in your life, your good friends, 
You might not want to call your avoidance, but your friends usually know when you're avoiding. My husband calls me out on it all the time. The other day I was on a plane, I got an email that I hated. I took a picture, <laughs> sent it to him, and the text goes, do not respond. That's reacting. That's avoidance. You cannot do this, Luana. And I like, I, I had composed the email back, by the way. I was about to send the email. Your family and friends, your loved one, your close friends, they are good mirrors for us. They make us better, especially those friends that can call you on your shit. Mm. Look at them and have a conversation about avoidance. I bet they can help you. Amazing. What about people that have, uh, what about parents or loved ones that have somebody that struggles with anxiety and a lot of avoidance? How do you support somebody? So supporting somebody, especially in heightened anxiety, can be very challenging. Um, I just had a client of mine say that he's at the end of his wife. Like, she won't get on a plane. She will not do anything that is physically active because increase. So they, they want to go on this beautiful vacation. But she's like, well, it has to be an electrical bike. And it has to be um, snorkeling, not scuba diving. Ha like, she's basically containing anything that's related. So he said to me, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm done with this, right? The first piece is really trying to, number one, get the person some help if they are in that level of distress. But the second one is asking how you can be helpful, okay? Because often we want to help people, but we want to help them in the way that we know to help. Mm. So you, the example of Oakley and you're saying to him, like, just get over this. <laughs> because that works for you, Mel. Like, that works for you. Sometimes. <laughs> Not, but, but, it, but it seems like a strategy that you can, you can muscle through, right? And so... It's in the case of Oakley, it's like, what would be helpful? This is one piece. Like, what would be helpful for you right now? How can I support you? Two, if it is avoidance that that person is sort of talking about, listen, I want to be helpful, but I'm not going to help you avoid. And that's important for parents. If your kid is terrifying going to school, keeping them at home is just adding to the avoidance. Mm. So how do I support my kid getting to school? I'm going to go with you onto the parking lot. We're going to go early and I'm going to walk you to your classroom. I'm going to actually help you by staying with you a day at school, right? Parents tend to try to take their kids away. That's a parent level avoidance and it's making your kids sick. So you need to find a way to approach with your kid at their level. I made this mistake when our kids, Kendall and Oak in particular, had pretty significant episodes of anxiety. Uh, there was a six-month period where each one of them slept on the floor of our bedroom. And I was so tired, that was my excuse, that I would just let them sleep there. They'd wander down in the middle of the night. I wouldn't want to have to get out of bed and walk them back up and deal with the pushback and deal with the emotions. And so I would let them stay there. And then it morphed into me just making a little bed on the ground on my side of the bed. And the funny thing is, is they were smart enough to know, even when they were sleepwalking, that they don't go to Chris's side of the bed because he would get up. They just come to mine. And I could almost, in the middle of my sleep, sense that they were there and I would just lift up the blanket in the middle of the night and it lasted for six months i made it worse yeah and you're not alone mel i've heard this from so many mothers before because see you're exhausted already right this is why i talk a lot about we need to learn to regulate ourselves and use those approaches for ourselves first so that we can be the best parents because mm. if you're already on the negative you did what you needed to do to survive right and i bet there's a lot of mothers listening to us who are doing similar things because they feel like they don't have anything on their gas any gas on their tank so they have to do this and the thing is it does make it worse that's the only problem and it makes it worse true. for you and the kid because we're teaching the opposite we want to teach the kid right and 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 it is hard like <laughs> my 5 year old now has this thing with dogs and i'm like let what I really want to say is you're not afraid of dogs go go, go talk to what I do is okay can we just stay far enough from the dog can you mm. look at the dog can we and you know we had this conversation yesterday I heard you had dogs and I said so if you meet her she has dogs but what am I going to do and I said we're going to stay there and we're going to learn about her dogs and but do I have to touch no you don't have to touch but you have to show up and you have to be there because I, you know, and there's this instinct as a mother. One day I saw myself wanting to cross the street because Diego is a big dog and I got a little uncomfortable. But I was like, I'll hold your hand and we're just going to wait. We're going to pause and we're going to let the dog go by. Mm. I'm not going to go towards the dog either. I, I could see the fear. But as a mom, I wanted to protect him. I wanted to take him out of there. Yeah. It is not what we want to do. Wow. What about um, the sleeping example? 
what would you counsel a patient to do if they were in that cycle where a child's coming down, wanting to climb into bed? What do you do? You know, my husband did the sleep training at our house um, <laughs> because... <laughs> I was like, I don't want to hear kids screaming. And, and so I'm, I'm sharing this as a mother because I remember Diego screaming for two or three days and now he sleeps really well. And so I'm very thankful to David. But what you want to do with sleep and any kind of things that are containment, right? Kids function better if they have a sense of safety and mm -hmm. they know what to predict. And so you have that conversation that this is your bed and that's where you sleep. And you cannot have any sleep ups. So if the kid comes the first night and you're exhausted, you take them to their bed and you might have to take them to their bed 10 times that night and 10 times the next night. But the first day that you let them sleep there, even for 10 seconds, you're basically telling them that they can push the boundaries. Kids are learning by our modeling. That's true. And once we, they learn it, oh, kids are so good. They're going to push a little more. They're going to push a little more. And we then stop giving a little more. And so in situations like this, it has to be zero tolerance. No, you don't come here. No, you don't come here. You're right. And pretty quickly, to tell you the truth is if you do that, you extinguish the behavior. It's true because they're uncomfortable being alone in their bed. And so you're teaching them to tolerate that discomfort. That is, and that's a skill they need to learn for the rest of their life because they're going to have to do, it's called emotion regulation psychology. And you're teaching them basic emotion regulation by teaching them that it's okay to have that discomfort and that they're safe in their bed. And over time, it goes away. And that's what we need to teach ourselves. That's exactly what Because we all this ourselves. avoidance is simply us not being able to tolerate as adults our own uncomfortable emotions. That is all there is. We get uncomfortable when we run like we're a kid. We go running into our parents' room and, and now we're stuck in a cycle. Yeah. But instead of running to mom and dad's room, we're running to the vodka bottle or we're avoiding the email or we're holding on to the application because that's a way to avoid the risk or the pain or the like fear that we have. And we're just building more pain, more fear, and more discomfort. This is so fascinating. This is from this is a, an 11th grader. This is an interesting. Well, Anxiety like, is consuming me, and I'm so scared. 11th grade. Mm, okay. Well, I think my first thing is that you're not alone. I think a lot of people feel it. I also have anxiety um, and it's very scary. It is very scary and it, it can feel very consuming. Um, my anxiety, I'll, I'll give you a little peek into my window is what I get like, but when I was younger, I used to be very scared of throwing up. And so my anxiety morphed into this thing now even nowadays that whenever I'm anxious, I just feel as though I'm going to throw up. I never do, but I always feel like I'm going to throw up. And it was very overbearing. It was very uh, scary. And I felt very alone for a lot of it. And I felt very misunderstood. And my advice to you is that if it is feeling like you cannot live your life anymore, you should seek therapist or you should tell somebody maybe not a therapist tell a parent tell a friend just tell anybody that is huge that's the first step because then you're not letting it run their run your life you're showing that you're in control you can tell people what's going on can i ask a question yeah so when you say you can't live your life do you mean and the anxiety is getting to a point where you're like opting out of doing things yes you're yes. managing your anxiety Mm -hmm. Because your anxiety, you're so worried about your anxiety. That you're like not living your life. Like your friends are all hanging out and they're going out to dinner and you're too anxious. So you're just like, I don't want to be anxious. Like I don't want to go. That's, and that was you. That was me. So that's when you should start telling somebody. Um, I have two things I want to add on to that. I said something about therapy. Uh, therapy's great. I love therapy. I have a great therapist. And second is medication is also great. I, when I took medication as a kid, I was like, I'm different from everybody. Like I have to take medication because I have a problem. There's something wrong with me, but there's nothing wrong with you. If you take medication, I mean, every, like literally everybody takes medication. <laughs> like, 
I take it. I take it all to Advil is like medication. Like there's nothing wrong with you if you're taking medication for anxiety. And honestly, if you're taking medication, like you're going to be able to live your life better. You're going to be able to go out to that dinner with your friends. You're going to be able to go on that walk or that run. You're going to have a good time. So. And so get, do what you need to do to get the anxiety under control. Yeah. And I recommend if you don't know where to start, just tell somebody. Tell somebody. And tell them everything. Like, don't leave some stuff out. Don't be like, hey, I'm kind of anxious every now and then. Like, be like, I am anxious and it is terrifying every day. Great. And here's the other thing. The tools and strategies that are out there actually work. Yeah, they do work. And anxiety is a, t is a scary thing, but it's temporary. If you follow the tools and strategies that work. It is 100% temporary. Yeah. Yeah. And you will feel better. The best feeling, I can assure you, is when you look back and you're like, I was at a bottomless pit and now I'm outside and I'm looking back at it and I'm like, wow, like I felt that way. That's crazy. Yeah. You don't even, you can't even believe that you felt that bad. Mm -mm. That was me a year. Do you remember Mother's Day a year ago? I remember a lot of things a year ago. <laughs> I remember a lot. I remember a lot. When I was sobbing about the fact that we had sold our house and I was begging dad to try to get it back because I didn't yeah. want to move here. Yeah, I remember and, that. And you three kids were here. I and remember I, I like told my friends, I was like, guys, we're going to move back to like Massachusetts. <laughs> like my mom's like pretty sure this time <laughs> like, you should see her. <laughs> she is freaking. I was in a full blown anxiety attack. What was it like for you as a kid to see me lose it? Like really have a mental health breakdown? I think... It was helpful and scary. How like, is it helpful? Because it's nice to know that your parents, uh, well, it's nice to know that your parents can break down and that like if you as a kid see your parent as this strong, like tall, super emotionally put together person, that's how you're going to see them forever. And when you grow up and you see your parent break down for the first time, you're going to be like, oh my goodness, like what? And so when I was a kid and I was young and I saw you break down, and I saw you break down again in the future. I was like, oh, like, this is just what happens. Like, people break down. Like, it's totally fine. Maybe not totally fine, but, like, it's fine. I was used to it. Yeah. You can't be happy all the time. Nobody's happy all the time. No. And life is going to be ups and downs. And I think you're right. It is helpful to watch the adults in your life process things and mm. realize that there are periods in your life where you're going to feel like you're in a bottomless pit. Yeah. And then all of a sudden the clouds pass and things are sunny again. Yeah. And that's just part of life. Yeah. And you don't need to share like the nitty gritty with your kids. You don't need to tell them everything that's like making you upset or why, but you know, let them in. Like they are part of your family. They're there to support you. It's good to tell them how you're feeling and how you can be supported. Yeah. Um, my 14 year old son is dyslexic and feels Twins. different. <laughs> Twins. My 14 year old son is dyslexic and feels different and dumb. Mm. And shuts down instead of trying harder. Mm. Help. I like this question because when I was diagnosed with dyslexia as a kid, I was I felt the same way. I was like, I'm so dumb. Like I can't read. I can't believe this. Like I'm dumber than everybody. And I like remember you'd be like, Well, the people on Shark Tank are dyslexic. And I was like, <laughs> Shut the fuck up. Like I don't care about the people on Shark Tank. <laughs> They don't matter, all right? They could be dyslexic, but they're also multi-millionaires. Like, I'm, I'm 11, all right? What do I have, all right? I have $2 to my name. Um, <laughs> but, but what I'm going to say is that uh, there's a lot of techniques and skills you can learn to make dyslexia more manageable. Um, it's also different for everybody. Uh, it's different in that sense. Um, but you are not dumb if you are dyslexic. Um, you, what's actually happening is that, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, but like the scientific thing is that your neural, your, uh, your neural pathways like take longer to form. And so you can have the same, uh, strong neural pathways as other people it just takes a little bit longer to get there. Is that... Yeah. Does that right? Basically, yeah. your brain wiring is a little bit different. And there are techniques and strategies that you can use to really, like you basically had your dyslexia remediated. Yeah. By, you, can, you can have it like 
put like pushed down. Yeah, because you're you you just basically train your brain to wire and fire new neural pathway connections, and it's called Orton Gillingham. That is the gold standard uh, tutoring method, and so it's not about uh, trying harder. And that's what is really important. Your brain learns differently. And because you're dyslexic, you have profoundly different talents. Yeah. You know, you're being asked to sit in a classroom and do things that your brain is not firing to do. But I bet that you are way more creative than everybody else. Yep. I bet that you can solve problems in creative ways. I bet you are probably more talkative. Yeah, definitely. I bet you have much better profound spatial awareness, meaning you're phenomenal at video games Mm -hmm. and at Legos and Mm -hmm. about building things. Mm -hmm. And you're going to be an and you're an incredible problem solver. And so understanding that you've got these unbelievable talents that developed because other parts of your brain developed. Yeah. That is a superpower. For sure. And that's why so many entrepreneurs and actors and professors and people in the arts have dyslexia because by not having the neural pathways fully formed as it relates to reading and holding words in your mind and yeah. decoding words and and also holding pencils and and being yeah. able to write you developed other parts of your brain and mm-hmm. that's a really cool thing and so first of all I would say stop saying try harder yeah and if you have not gotten the proper tutoring protocols put in place that really help and other things really help like being able to listen to books instead of reading yeah 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 i listen to books all the time yeah because like i i'm not the best reader so like i'm a little slow but listening to books is huge like that's great yeah and also being able to type instead of handwrite Mm -hmm. there you can get the teacher's notes there are all kinds of things that help and you know i remember it was really interesting because you're an excellent math student but when professors or teachers require you to show your work you basically fail because you can't explain the steps that you took to get there yeah. your brain has I, all these I just shortcuts like can do it in my head and like I, can yes. write, I write down a few numbers just to remember things but other than that like i can't really so if you have dyslexia you're not dumb all right what you are, are you? you are you're incredibly powerful in other aspects that aren't the school environment yeah and that's perfectly fine because school is not your whole life That's right. I love that. I worry a lot about anxiety. And I worry about how we seem to have a parenting crisis of parents who can't tolerate their kids' anxiety and are allowing their kids' anxiety to run the house. Can you give us some advice, especially given that teenagers are so such emotional beings to begin with how do you give space for the normal emotion without letting a teenager's emotion run your house or dictate what they do well thank you for bringing up this i mean it's a huge topic um and actually between untangled and the emotional lives of the teenagers i published a book called under pressure confronting the epidemic of stress and anxiety in girls But what I hear all the time is 80% applies to kids of all genders, which I am sure is true. And in that book, I actually make, at the outset, a case for healthy anxiety and a case for healthy stress. And we have always, as psychologists, recognized that healthy anxiety is the anxiety that alerts us when something's wrong. It is not on its own pathological. And we have not helped the situation by using the same word to describe Mm. healthy anxiety and something that we diagnose. Um, it's sort of better set. We have the word sadness and we have depression for the diagnosis, but we use anxiety, you know, in both categories. So that doesn't help us much. And same with stress. Stress is actually the human experience of adaptation. We experience mm. stress anytime things change, anytime we have to adapt to a new condition. And it can be a wonderful condition or a lousy condition, but we always experience stress under change conditions. And we only consider stress pathological if it is chronic or traumatic. But all other stress, we just talk into the, you know, helping you grow doesn't always feel good category. Um, what I will tell you is that the most important thing for people to know about anxiety is that avoidance feeds anxiety. And this is one of the, again, most critical findings in psychology and one that we have done a completely terrible job of getting out to the public. And here's how it works. 
if I, let's say, have some social avoidance, some social anxiety, and there's a party that I've been invited to, and it's a good party to go to, right? It's a rational, like, should be fun, a friend of mine's party. But say I feel anxious, and say I agree to go to the party, but then the day of my anxiety is starting to really accelerate. And then I'm thinking, I don't think I should go. I don't want to go. And say my parent is like, oh, it's just a party. You don't have to go, right? Here's what happens. The first thing that happens is I feel so much better, right? My anxiety was cresting, and then I get to avoid, and it immediately plummets. It's like what we call reinforcement, right? Instantly relief. And so the upshot of that is the next time, next time I feel anxious, I know what helps me feel better. It's avoidance. So that's the first problem. The second problem is that I never go to the party and check out how how it is, right? So whatever I have daydreamed about how terrifying this party is or how to, how, you know, like mm. how cruel everyone will be at the party, that is now sealed in amber. And I continue to believe it because I have no counter evidence. Whereas if I go to the party, I'm like, oh, wait, it's not so bad, but if I don't go. So it actually entrenches anxiety to avoid the things we fear. Now, if a kid is avoiding school, which a lot of kids are right now, there's a third issue, which is the minute you don't show up at school, you are out of the loop socially and you are out of the loop academically. So it's that much harder to get back in. So there's not a lot in psychology where there is agreement across the entire field, where there is zero controversy. But on this one, everyone's in agreement that avoidance feeds anxiety and everyone is in agreement that exposure is the answer. And what I mean by that is you have to get in. You have to, you know, you don't have to go to every party all the time, but you have to baby step your way in. You have to go check out the party. You cannot have the reinforcement avo avoidance. You cannot have the daydream become the reality. And so if this is your kid and they're like, I can't go to school, I can't go to the party, I can't, you know, fill in the blank, you say, all right, here's the deal. You're going to go to the party for 20 minutes and then I'm going to forget something and text you <laughs> and see if, you know, you need me to pick you up. And if you need me to pick you up after 20 minutes, I'll get you. But if you can stay, that would be better. So you have to negotiate. You have to help them get in. Breathing is powerful for helping to control anxiety. Reframing is powerful for helping to control anxiety. But avoidance is anxiety's best friend. It's devastating because it, you're right. Like I think about the fact that I was homesick at every camp, so much so that I would just escalate it until the counselors got so tired and my parents would show up because it works. It goes back to your original thing. We do these things because they work. They work. And when we allow our kid to keep transferring from one school to another because they can't handle it, we are locking in anxiety as a coping mechanism and avoidance as a coping mechanism. Wow. Can you talk a little bit about what you were feeling and kind of not knowing the words, depression, anxiety, anger, like what was it like for you, Lorenzo, to be a kid and to lose your dad at 10 and to not have your mom around and to experience the racism and bias that you experienced in your life so that you can describe for people who may not have considered, oh, He's describing how I feel. That's depression. He's describing how I feel. That's anxiety. So tell us a little bit about what it was like for you. Yeah. You know, a lot of it was, it was just the way of life, honestly. Um, I had, I, honestly, I knew in some ways, in many ways, that I had a really good upbringing, which I really did. Um, I believe my aunt and uncle did a really good job of ensuring that in the, so many ways that I you know, was able to have the support that I needed. But beyond that, I knew that there was something not really right for the most part around the way that I felt about things. How did and you so, feel? Um, lost, mm. uh, a lot of times very angry. Um, and the, the reality of it was, you know, I, maybe I blamed it on, oh, I don't like this teacher at school or I'm not getting along with friends in the neighborhood. But the reality of it was I didn't feel seen and heard because the truth of the matter, I didn't have my mother and father around and I didn't, you know, share that love and, you know, that connection with them. Um, so I didn't feel really seen and heard and I did feel that I had been left out and, you know, and, and so I think in a, a, so many ways. I was struggling emotionally from those challenges 
and from those, you know, the, the anxieties that came with that, you know, do they love me? Um, you know, did I, did they, did I do something wrong? Is, is it a reason that they're not here? Did, did I have something to do with that? Like, these are the kind of questions that go on in a young person's head um, when they're, you know, when, especially when everything has not truly been explained because, you know, I think one thing as adults, we want to ensure that, you know, our children have a great life. But I think giving them more of the story sometimes may even hurt them to tell you the real story. And so I think in so many ways, you know, um, that was kind of my reality. But the reality behind it is that I, you know, really struggled emotionally. And it really showed up in, in, in school. You know, I uh, was in a behavior health facility at the age of 10. Um, what, and explain I, that to people who have not worked in criminal justice like I have. So what does behavioral health facility mean? Yeah, so I went into, a, a you know, had some challenges in school and, you know, uh, had been kicked out a few times. I think I was probably more in the third grade at that point. So, you know, could stay in class. So it was, hey, you know, this is my next option. Can I, can I just say something? When you have kids that go undiagnosed with depression and anxiety and who feel invisible, of course there will be behavioral issues. And it makes me very angry and sad, Lorenzo, how many kids are getting disciplined because they, quote, can't behave when the real issue is there are mental health challenges that the child is facing or there are learning style differences that the child has that are not recognized and addressed by the capable adults around them. Yes. And so it just makes me angry to hear that a third grader is being kicked out of school because mm-hmm. of behavioral issues. So here you are, you're getting kicked out of school. You're having behavioral issues because you can't understand or tolerate this like just swirl of emotion that you're feeling. And you end up in this behavioral health facility. What was that like? Yeah, you know, it was. I was away for about two months. Um, they did allow us to go home on weekends. Um, it was mostly structured, seeing a therapist, you know, going to do school during the day. Um, <clears throat> but obviously, it was very, um, it was a very dark place to be at as a young kid. Uh, someone that I had never been away from home for that amount of time. Um, um, I had just lost my dad and really that was my way. I was really angry and upset from the loss of him. So that really swirled into challenges at school, which led me there. And I think that's the one thing that we have to recognize in society is that when someone's going through grief and those different challenges, that it can look different and it can manifest into mental health challenges. And if you already felt lost in life and wondered if people cared about you and wondered where you belong, to have your dad then die, that only just kicks that in high gear. And so it doesn't surprise me that it comes out as anger. And I think that's what happens a lot of time with men in particular, is you guys get sad and you guys experience loss or disappointment and or bias or discrimination and you shove it down. And what happens when you shove all that down is that a volcano erupts. And that's what you're describing. And so, you know, a kid that needed grief counseling ends up acting out at school and then gets sent somewhere for behavioral health, which is just, again, pointing to how we fail people so much when it comes to challenges that we face emotionally and mentally. Did you, is that when you learned that it might be anxiety or depression or did they just sort of calm you down and send you back to school? Um, I think I understood it more as this was a getaway because my dad had passed. It was just in my reality, there was a getaway from home to really process the loss of him and I think everything, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, And so, you know, moving past that point, going back into school, um, it was also a sense of shame attached to where I had been, you know, and I think this is where the stigma of mental health really shows up because here I am going back to school and like, oh, where have you been? I hadn't seen you in a while. And it's like, yeah, you know, 
I've been to this place, right? I, you know, and trying to make it more cool than knowing it wasn't cool because not wanting to be shame. And I yeah. think that's where, that's very common is, uh, you know, we think about mental health and having these conversations is because that's how it typically looks where, you know, we, we don't really empower the situation more or less and say, yeah, I was kind of this place and it was different than what I'm really describing, but really I'm describing it differently because I'm ashamed of who I really was. Right. And so yeah. I experienced that early on in life, which mm. really also I think can be a part of our lived experience. That's right. Because if you are surrounded by either a family or a community or a entire culture where there is shame or judgment for getting help or, you know, it's weak if you are struggling emotionally or mentally. Like, I always find it interesting that, for example, if you're in financial stress, like you can't pay your freaking bills. I, I've been in that place where I cannot, I, I can't put groceries on the table. I'm sitting there, you know, with the check card and I'm like, dear God, please let there be a computer failure and let this go through. Cause I know there's no money in this account, but you know, maybe, maybe I'll swipe it and it'll work. And worrying about real financial stress is a form of anxiety. It is. Feeling Definitely. shame that you can't pay your bills can lead to depression. And so these yep. very real experiences that people have lead to mental health challenges that make it worse and make it harder for you to face it. But so you come back from this and you continue with school and then you have one more incident, right? That really was a wake up call for you. Yep. Can you describe what happened? Yeah, so, you know, later, you know, I, I always say fast forward to, you know, being 17 years old, I, I moved past that point, you know, of going through that, you know, and I always say I had a, I kind of went through my honeymoon period after post being in a behavioral health facility and, you know, um, you know, and then I found myself joining a, a gang mm -hmm. uh, and that led to, you know, me being incarcerated uh, with a, um, you know, due to a firearm. But I, I want to back up yeah. because I, I think one of the things that I really want to shine light on is it wasn't me joining a gang and being charged with a firearm that really is old. But I want to really also encompass that the loss, again, the mental health challenges and the not being, you know, it's, it's a core African proverb that say a child who does not feel warm from the village will burn it down. Mm. And I was that child that did not feel loved and seen. So everything moving forward was to be a detriment, not knowing that's really what I was causing. But however, it was a lash out on self as a, hey, I'm going to, you know, put myself around these kind of people and put myself around these kind of risks. It's something that I internalized that also did manifest it to uh, being a part of the legal system. Your aunt and uncle must have been beside themselves with you. Yeah. Because she does not seem like the kind yeah. of woman that would play around. You know yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah, they were, <laughs> yeah, they was very uh, furious, to say the least, for sure. They was very, um, and honestly, they, you know, they, they really did a really good job of instilling morals and, and just principles. I think that allowed me to become the person that I am today to really serve, you know, um, and, and, and obviously um, show up in, in the community the way I do because they really stood on great things. But I think myself knowing the challenges that I went through, I veered into that path. Yeah. So, well, I think what happens, Lorenzo, and I don't know if this is true for you, so I would love to hear your thoughts on this, is that you were clearly in an environment in that barber shop with your aunt in particular, very tied to your values. Yep, and yep. when sorrow and despair and feeling lonely and invisible and all that grief hits, it can create a barrier yes. between you and your ability to connect to those values and ground yourself there. You become lost in the swirl of emotion and anger and the proverb that you said that when a child doesn't feel warmed by the village, they'll burn it down. 
that's why anger rises to the surface when people feel isolated and unseen and when they're struggling. And so yeah. it doesn't surprise me that first of all, mental health challenges are what led you to losing your way, but that ultimately when you started to address the mental health challenges, you found yourself easily connecting back with those values. And so, you know, how did you turn it around? What was it? Was there a moment when you were incarcerated and you're 17 years old where you're like, I got to turn this shit around. Like, I, like this is, I'm either going down, like there are forks in the road in your life where you don't realize it in the moment, but you make one decision and it changes the rest of your life. So was there a moment where you had an epiphany as you're in this low place that you got to do something different? Like what happened? Yeah. So, you know, I'll never forget the week coming up to court and, you know, I, you know, I just remember a lot of the kids in there, it was, you know, so a lot of them would have been repeat offenders. They had been in and out and we were finding out, you know, the court was that Monday morning. It was like, you know, figured out who was going to be my judge. And um, it was this one particular judge that everyone was just like, yeah, if you get this judge, like they're going to lock you up longer. You'll be here longer. So I was doing everything I could to, you know, praying like, oh, I just hope I don't get this certain judge. Well, I so happily got a judge that was, uh, you know, very much opposite to what I think the other young people was, was saying while I was in there. But saying all this to say, that weekend as I sat in there and I was getting ready for court, it just kept rumbling in my head that this was the same place that I was born in. This is where my father was. And I just remember feeling just so hurt, so lost, so empty. And I just, I remember saying, if I could get out of this, I don't ever want to experience this again. Now, I'm 17 years old. I'm a month before being 18. Um, and I was supposed to be enjoying um, my last year of being in school at this time. Um, and so I so you know, got tied up with a gun and, you know, following the wrong people. And so uh, when I got to court that, that Monday, you know, I was given a second chance. Um, and a lot of it was because of my aunt. And, you know, and I think <laughs> them pleading with the court to give me another chance uh, because I had never been in no prior trouble. Um, and obviously I just got, you know, caught up in a situation. But I remember promising the judge that if, if she could give me another chance that I would go to college that I wouldn't, she would never have to worry about finding me in the system again. And I kept my word. And I look back today and that's something that I, you know, I always say that I, you know, um, I never wanted to do was to be a part of, to have to go into that small room ever again and um, spend any time. And so, you know, I, I think it was, it was just a collective of just hating where I was in that moment, hating the way I felt. Um, but also being scared to know that I could end up spending more time there if I didn't figure out how to get out of this situation or if it would continue. Um, and so that just led me, you know, to want to just change everything. Um, and so, yeah, that was, I, you know, I think that was the turning point for me. Um, you know, that time that I spent, you know, in juvenile was just really, um, it was just really eye opening and I, I didn't really enjoy it. Um, I hated every bit of it. Um, and I was just, you know, I think I just, I just was so focused on wanting to be much better than I was. Um, and I think it goes back again to just the values that my aunt and uncle really instilled in me growing up. You know, despite my challenges I went through, um, knowing that um, I could really create a life better for myself, regardless of where I had came from. So, Well, I think it's so poignant what you said about the fact that you were reflecting on this is where I was born yep. and this is not where I'm going to end up. And my father's story is not going to be my story. Yep. And it certainly isn't because you went from that courtroom back to high school. You graduated. You never looked back. You then uh, went to Arkansas Baptist College. And what did you study there? Uh, human services. Yep. <laughs> and for people that don't know what that means, what, what is human services? Yeah, so it's mostly, you know, um, yeah, I think in a better, broader terms is supporting the quality of life and well-being of people. 
uh, whether that's through, you know, economical economics, you know, um, civil, social um, practices um, of uplift, uplifting people. Um, so the, the work that I do, obviously, right, is supporting, you know, people to getting access to mental health services um, is a, I think, a clear example of, you know, what I went to Arkansas Baptist College for, but it could also be um, as well as for, you know, supporting, you know, young people that, you know, um, are, that may be at risk of going into the criminal justice system. Um, so those are just obviously just pure examples. Okay. So you graduate and yeah. what was it like to graduate? You're like, damn, I did it. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to take this photo and send it to that judge and tell her I kept my word. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it was a it was an illuminating experience. Um, you know, again, I think it was one of those um, can't believe can't believe we made it. You know, can't believe I made it. So I, it it was, and it, you know, again, the, the people that I grew up around, the the folks that I had went to school with, and the, most of the people just growing up in the urban community in the South. You know, it was just one or more things. You know, it was you know either I'm gonna go be an athlete and go to college or, you know, I'm gonna get lost to the streets and, you know, get on some kind of drugs and never make it, or I may not make it at all and I may be dead. And so, you know, it was just only a few options. And obviously I, I wasn't an athlete. And so, and I, you know, and I think the other two options just wasn't favorable. Um, so I, I did everything I could to know going to college and I really um, worked hard to, to ensure that I could get my way out of that. And so I'm, I'm glad that I was, you know, saw the favorable road to work towards, you know, um, graduating and, and getting to this point. So, Well, thank God you did because your organization is now helping over 3 million people a year in sure. terms of mental health advocacy. And so let's talk about the fact that right after college, you went and worked with the Department of Human Services. And, you know, I'm outlining your story, Lorenzo, because again, you are an example of somebody who made a decision, who reconnected with his values, who leaned into the struggle, who allowed himself to be vulnerable, and you turned your whole life around. And now you're taking all of this and you've turned it into this incredible, incredible organization, the, you know, the Confess Project, where you're helping millions of people. And no. your story and life is an example to all of us that if there is some change you want to make in your life, it is possible to do it. And if you are willing to serve others, you will be blown away by the difference that you can make. Hey, it's Mel. Thank you so much for being here. If you enjoyed that video, by God, please subscribe because I don't want you to miss a thing. Thank you so much for being here. We've got so much amazing stuff coming. Thank you so much for sending this stuff to your friends and your family. I love you. We create these videos for you. So make sure you subscribe. Mwah.